In the previous video, we discussed the ways researchers study cognition, focusing on two behavioral measurements, accuracy and response time. In these next two videos, we'll address another set of methods for studying the mind, those based in neuroscience. When most think about how the mind is studied, they think about measuring brain activity. And indeed, studying the brain or what is called neuroscience is a very powerful approach that both receives a great deal of funding from grant agencies such as the federal government and holds great power in convincing the general population. After all, images tend to be more convincing and brain images lend themselves to being perceived as one of the most authoritative ways of demonstrating the truth of the mind. There are a number of assumptions in what I've just said. As critical consumers of science, it's important to understand what neuroscience can and cannot say, what knowledge it provides, and what are its limitations. The first assumption is that when we study the brain, we're directly studying the mind. This leads to a profound question. Is the mind the same as the brain? We often use the two interchangeably. We may say, I've got a lot on my mind, or after a tough exam, we may say that my brain hurts. When an area of the brain is damaged, whether from injury or disease, we can observe changes in how the mind works. On the other hand, as much as scientists are able to study your brain, observe its pattern of activity, the size and location of different structures, scientists can't answer a pretty fundamental question. What is it like to have the experience you're having right now? The scientist is unable to see the brain scan or measure brain activity and answer this basic question, something that's so immediate and intuitive to you who's having this experience right now. This is because neuroscience is not a direct way of studying the mind. Instead, like those behavioral measurements previously mentioned, it's indirect. The neuroscientist studies the brain and infers from this data what may be happening in the mind, generally speaking. Even when the neuroscientist observes that some brain areas light up right before some kind of mental activity, such as speaking, this doesn't mean that that particular brain area causes speaking. Rather, it suggests that this brain area is associated or correlated with speaking. In other words, it's somehow involved in the process of speaking. That doesn't mean that it's the origin of speech itself. As such, much of neuroscience research is correlational research. Despite many, even scientists, speaking as if certain brain areas cause certain cognitive functions. Part of the difficulty is that so much of the brain is interconnected that even simple acts like speaking involve numerous regions throughout the brain. Similarly, every cognitive act requires many other cognitive acts, often happening below consciousness. To speak requires deciding what to say, figuring out how to say it, considering the social context and perspective of a listener, Retrieving the stored mental representations associated with the ideas, sounds, and grammar necessary to speak coherently. And finally, executing the motor movements necessary to create those correct sounds. So to speak of a speech center in the brain or any other center is often misleading, even if there's an element of truth to it. That element of truth is that certain brain areas do appear to be specialized for uh, specific cognitive abilities. To make matters more complicated, the research establishing a correlation between brain area and cognitive function doesn't necessarily apply universally. For example, those with hearing impairments may use their so-called speech centers differently. Also, if research is predominantly focused on English-speaking participants in the United States, we can raise the question as to whether such research generalizes to people from different cultures and languages. So while we will talk about brain areas associated with specific cognitive abilities, we also have to keep in mind that this leaves a lot up for interpretation as to what that means. This limitation also means we can't rely solely on brain science to tell us how the mind works. We need both behavioral methods and neuroscience methods, and perhaps we need other approaches as well, such as qualitative analysis of 
first person experience as another source of data for understanding the mind. The best research incorporates multiple methods and we have to be careful to avoid oversimplifying such as some of the famous ways of expressing brain activity right brain versus left brain, the reptilian brain versus the mammalian brain, or terms such as a love center, religion center, or morality center. That being said, we can now talk about some techniques neuroscientists use to indirectly measure the mind. As a way of beginning this discussion, we'll focus on a particular area of research that addresses what is called the cross-race effect. The cross-race effect involves a bias or preference for individuals whose facial features are similar to one's own. Such a proposed bias is thought to explain a variety of observed research findings. I'll focus on a 2012 article entitled The Neuroscience of Race. This article reviews and summarizes the scientific research pointing to a network of interacting brain regions involved in unintentional implicit expression of racial attitudes. And this influences all kinds of decisions made in everyday life. The article focused on black and white race categories in particular. This review article focused on studies using fMRI. fMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. An MRI is like a CT scan or a computerized tomography scan in that both create images of what the brain looks like. However, a CT scan uses a rotating x-ray machine to image the brain, whereas an MRI scan uses strong magnets to generate an image. Without getting too detailed regarding its physics, these superconducting magnets excite the atoms in our body, leading them to emit a signal that a computer can translate into an image. The stronger the magnet, which is measured in Teslas, the more detail you can get of the brain. The benefits of an MRI over a CT scan is that an MRI produces a more detailed image and doesn't expose you to the levels of radiation received from a CT scan. The disadvantages include MRIs being far more expensive as well as potentially dangerous if you have any metal on or in your body. These pictures provide information about what the brain looks like, but it doesn't provide info on how the brain is functioning. In the image I'm showing you now, what do you think is wrong with this brain? Most, including scientists who are familiar with neuroscience, would not be able to find anything wrong with this brain. However, what if I told you that this is a brain image of someone who's dead? In fact, it is, and this demonstrates a significant limitation of some kinds of neuroimaging techniques, what are called structural neuroimages. They show you what the brain looks like, but not whether or how it's functioning. So this is where we get the term functional. Functional neural images provide information on what the brain is doing. One kind of functional image is the PET scan or positron emission tomography scan. This neural imaging technique requires being injected with a radioactive dye that contains glucose. The brain uses this glucose as its main fuel source and activated brain areas use more glucose than other areas. Because the glucose is radioactive, when it's consumed by certain brain regions, it gives off a signal that can be measured, and this is used to create a map of brain activity. fMRIs employ a different technique. They measure blood flow, or the hemodynamic response. Through this response, blood carries sugar and oxygen to neurons, and the consumption of oxygen gives off a signal that can be detected by an MRI based on different magnetic qualities given off in those areas. This is called uh, the blood oxygen level dependent imaging or bold contrast imaging. This kind of imaging provides better resolution than PET scans, offering a more precise view of specific activated brain regions. With that knowledge in mind, we can begin to understand findings of this review article. The amygdala is an almond-shaped structure deep in the brain, and it's adjacent to the hippocampus, another structure that's associated with memory formation. The amygdala is, is associated with emotional responses, and in particular, fear responses and the formation 
stimulation of fear-related learning and memory. It's also one of the most studied brain areas when it comes to racial preferences. Many studies have found a greater bold response in the amygdala when presented with faces from different race groups. In other words, participants are placed in an fMRI machine and presented with images of faces while their brain activity is measured. The race-based facial preference is found more consistently in white than black participants. Some studies also suggest that it's unrelated to one's explicit or consciously held preferences. So someone who consciously expresses no preference for black or white faces may still show different levels of amygdala responses. This suggests that regardless of one's beliefs about race, implicit or unconscious biases may still be present at an emotional level and these biases may influence one's decisions. This may help to explain why someone may still act in racist ways despite not holding, at least consciously, racist beliefs. This area of research remains controversial and what I present to you is somewhat of an oversimplification. However, it hopefully provides a clear example of how neuroimaging can be used to study the mind and offer some potential insights for understanding something as complex as racism. At the same time, we have to be careful about how we interpret such research findings. Based on the uh, research described in this video, we don't want to conclude, for example, that the amygdala causes racism, nor should we too quickly conclude that just because someone has increased amygdala response that that necessarily means that they are racist or have or will engage in racist behaviors. That requires more research and it's a viable hypothesis based on the findings, but science requires caution and skepticism. However, this doesn't mean that science can be ignored simply because it doesn't confirm our own beliefs. We also must apply skepticism not only to our understanding of research, but also and perhaps especially to our own beliefs. For as much as science has limitations, our beliefs and assumptions are just as, if not more so, limited and biased. This is the difficulty we're having right now in our society as our skepticism toward experts has led many to place themselves as their own experts on a wide variety of issues. The next video will focus on the individual cells of the brain, neurons, and their activity. Thank you for watching and if you like this video, please feel free to subscribe. I'll see you next time.